Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Vegas Dice Kings today on 222 of 22. How do you figure that? It's so windy out, Danny. How are you, sir? By good. The way. Uh, you know, that date makes me want to get married again. Yeah, not. Not. Anyhow, it's so windy out there, the birds are walking. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty windy out there and a little chilly this morning out here in uh, Las Vegas, everyone. Uh, we're going to have a great show today. Uh, we got uh, talking a little bit about the Bones a little bit and the Mirage Hotel. That's, uh, that's all going to come into play. Danny, what do you think about uh, how the Bones all came about? You I know my bones are aching, uh, <laughs> Pat and Pendy. My bones are aching. I, I don't know about you, but yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, you all the time that we've been crap dealers and people grabbing a dice and doing all this and playing with them and rolling them and kissing them and hugging them and, you know, rubbing them on their wife's, uh, you know, chest. Uh, you want, you know, you stop and think, well, where did dice come from? Where did they originate from? And it's very interesting to know where it, they came from. And I'll give you a hint before Pat and Pending starts uh, laying it down to you, is that everyone realizes or knows that the cradle of civilization is Mesopotamia. What they didn't know is that they found something very interesting amongst all the other artifacts. And Pat and Pending, why don't you give them a clue? Well, some of the, some of them was what they called bones. It was not dice back then. They called them bones. Uh, they used pig knuckles a lot of times, and they marked them with uh, marked them with marks. And before they went out to uh, to war or wherever they do, they'd set it to castle, and uh, it called Hazard Castle. And they'd sit there and play this game. They'd throw them against the walls and everything before they went out for uh, for battle, just trying to make an extra buck or two so that you know they could feed their family or whatever. Uh, but that's how, just about how that all come back. I guess it goes back like 5,000 years. Well, uh, uh, according to uh, what they say, uh, 5,000 years ago, they found dice in a place called Terraguara, which was uh, somewhere in Mesopotamia, 5,000 years ago, B.C. B.C. And uh, actually, there's an exhibit at the University of Pennsylvania that has the... Uh, terracotta dice yeah, from Terragar and uh, also another uh, uh, set of uh, terracotta from 3000 BC so it, it's definitely uh, facts they're out there at this university check it out google it University of Pennsylvania and the dice that they found I've even been told that uh, at Mount Vesuvius they found uh, some people sitting there that was actually I guess they were frozen in time by the volcano that hit. But they were that covered they, in uh, they were covered in ash. In, in, uh, or, yeah, the, in the ash. Uh, yeah. And they supposedly had uh, had dice in their hands. They did. They were surrounded. They were in a table. They don't know exactly how, what they were using a dice for, but they were a set of dice, and they were sitting in a table. And of course, they were you know covered in uh, lava and ash. And of course, they did have a casino back then. It was called Mount Vesuvius Casino, and underneath it said, watch your own ash. Watch your own Believe ash. Believe me, it's that's a, true. Got hot dice. Oh, <laughs> and some people got really burned up about it, too, really let me tell you. There. Let me tell you. But uh, it, it's interesting, folks. Uh, the Egyptians, they, they also uh, used dice, but they were octagonal. Explain what that is. Uh, octagonal is eight-sided dice. They more or less like rolled like marbles. So they'd be rolling a little bit for a little uh, for a little while. Uh, how they numbered them, I don't exactly know exactly how they numbered it, but they did have certain uh, emblems on them that they knew. Of course, uh, we don't know since we're we're used to uh, regular inch cubicles. And what? We uh, see. How many sides on dice? Modern dice today? Oh, there's a the 360. Wow, <laughs> 360, no, six sides, six right? sides, six sides uh, as opposed to eight. But it's interesting to see that it one was one of the earliest games that people played uh, from 5,000 years ago. So, yes. and then what was it? A uh, hundred years ago, uh, when uh, the slave traders used to uh, bring the Brazilians in, that's when they uh, called it craps, and they brought their version of craps to many different uh, places where the slaves were taken, Brazilian slaves, and uh, they also had variations of craps back then. So 
The Brazilians are noted for having something to do with it morphing into the game of craps. Absolutely. It's supposed to be in China, too. They supposedly found uh, dice in China. They said it originated in China. Uh, you know, the, the exact whereabouts, I don't think they really, uh, really have unearthed all of that yet. I'm no. sure they're still checking into it. You know, I've been looking into a lot of it and everything. I know that most of the dice that we have now are made out of resin. You know, that, uh, of course, the pips, of which I talked about last week with the little white dots, that's the pips in there. You know, and they have different depths on those. Like you said, like if you have a dice that has a six up top, there's an ace at the bottom. Yes. And if there's a five up top, there's a deuce on the bottom. Four up top, three on the bottom. That's just how this game's configured. So it's uh, it's really... It's really a mathematical genius, whoever, uh, whoever put this all together. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm very impressed how all that works. Well, well yes, when you, you think about it, how fascinating the game is. Just like in the game of life, the dice continue to roll. The people come and go. I understand. They, they live and they die, but the dice keep on rolling. They keep right on rolling. And someone go. picks it up from the next person, and they keep on rolling. Sometimes it's a short roll. Sometimes it's a long roll. The, the fascinating thing about the game in general is that people are excited just to play the game. And when a roll starts to develop and all, all of a sudden you see the chips start to appear in abundance on the people's uh, rack and the, the euphoria, the look on their faces is just like they are so happy for a brief time. It's uh, unbelievable. It's very brief. It, it, know, at it, times, it's very brief. Yes. <laughs> the, the, uh, the excitement and the happiness is only short term. But in those moments, you, you, people forget all about their problems, uh, all the things that, you know, the high prices of everything and this and that. They come to Las Vegas to escape all of that. And they do. They escape. They, they can be at a crap table, patent pending nose, for eight hours six hours and they don't even realize how long they've been there they won't even go to the bathroom unless right. and, and unless they start uh, you know how they start marching in time and you see several people doing it and then the women get real fidgety and then they're kind of forced to have to go to the bathroom but and then we start marching in time like mm -hmm. yeah we know you have to go to the bathroom why don't you just go but they're afraid that they might they're miss something miss patent something. pending that they are they uh you know it's amazing to me about this game craps is I'm finding that we're getting a very young crowd out there now that's really taking an interest in the dice game and it's 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 really an interesting thing when I was breaking in, it was all older people and uh, you know we were used to dealing to all the older people now it's it's starting to be the younger crowd all them tech savvy uh, you know kids I call them that are uh, they're really uh, they're really into this game, and their wives are bringing their wives, their friends, more and more and more. These tables are getting busy with younger, younger people. It's uh, you know 21. That's nothing now to see people 21 to 25 years old that are all playing dice, and they all have that uh, that money. You know, it's 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 amazing how this uh, this this whole town is sort of changed over a little bit from the old now to the new. Same with uh, what's happening with the Mirage, bro. You know, that's that's all going to be new the here. The Mirage, shortly. the Mirage. Yeah, nice intro, Pat and Pending. Yeah. Excellent. You cracked the door open yeah, and opened, opened it, right it up. up right up. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Oh, look what we have here. Yes. You know, you know, folks, the Mirage has been iconic for many, many reasons. And Pat and Pending will tell you, one of the main reasons is it changed the face of Las Vegas. He did. Yes, yes it, it did. did. Pat and Pendant. Tell them tell him how it changed. Well, it changed by uh, back in the 70s when uh, they opened up uh, back east. New Jersey opened up and everything. Uh, things here in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas started going downhill. Uh, people started going back there. The town was starting to get tarnished a little bit. So Mr. Wynn come along. Steve went and started thinking, how can I change this whole concept of Las Vegas? We need to do something drastic to change it all. So he put his, uh, his mind together, which he, believe it or not, he has a brilliant mind. This guy, he's, he's changed Las Vegas forever. 
he put his mind together and decided that uh, he wanted to build something a Polynesian theme. And uh, he got that, I believe, from his uh, folks down in Florida. When he used to go to the Fountain Blue in Miami with his parents uh, for vacations or whatnot, uh, he used to sit there as a little boy and he would look around. He would look around, he'd look at the design, he'd look at the, he was fascinated with architect, he really was. And if you've seen or been to the Fountain Blue in uh, Miami, you notice how it's, how it's, you know, curved all the way around, uh, almost like an L shape, but, but longer. And uh, if you look at the Mirage today, that uh, was the design that he used for the Mirage. Sure. Uh, which they which they called which they call now mega resorts but he was the he was the first godfather one. of the mega resort he, absolutely uh, he had to figure out how he was going to build this thing and uh he, he found a guy that he liked real well they were real good friends was uh, michael milton yes who uh, at the time he had a bunch of junk bonds that decided to uh, loan steve win the money to build what is now the Mirage. He was going to call it the Golden Nugget, but they got talking about it and said, well, they don't want the old downtown to be out on the new called the Golden Nugget. So he figured out the Mirage. The well, well, excuse me, prior to that, they were kicking around the name Bombay. Bombay, well, that was the Builders. Yes. I believe that was the Builders yes. of the Mirage. Yes, Bombay, Bombay Club. Bombay Club was the Builders. Now, before the Mirage there, it was the Castaways. Yes. Before that was the San Susi. Yes, that's so, correct. Yeah. San Susi. San Susi. Man, and this could be a Jeopardy winner to my right. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And uh, it, was, uh, it was then that he decided that he w really needed to do something to change the face of this town. So he, he built this, uh, built the big volcano out front with all the water shooting up and all that stuff to attract the people in. And boy, did it ever. And oh. it, it's the first one. That uh, that was uh, 29 stories tall, had 6,400 people working for it, and he made the building in a uh, in like a, a three-way yes towers, a rectangle a like rectangle yeah. type of yeah. towers, and uh, they all and even what I didn't know, even the windows were a goldish color. They actually used gold dust to make those windows. That's amazing. That's amazing. That that's even something that uh, I didn't even know. Yeah, it's uh, it's. It's there, yeah. He did. He used the gold dust from that to make, uh, to put in the windows and everything to make, to give him that uh, that gold that gold sheen and everything. When he when he uh, uh, built that, it was at a cost of six hundred and thirty million. He borrowed five hundred and sixty five hundred twenty five million in junk bonds from Mike Milken to finance it, and also uh, the other hotel owners and almost everybody in Las Vegas was skeptical. He had to make a million dollars a day in order to uh, break even or uh, m maybe some profit. I'm not exactly sure because it had 3,044 rooms, the largest hotel in the world. And not only did it exceed the expectations, it became such a hit that the other casino operators took that and decided to build their own mega resorts like Mandalay Bay and a few others. And uh, it was just amazing. He, amazing. He, he forced them, he forced this town to build these mega resorts. He set the groundwork, and boy, did he ever. I mean, this thing was, was beautiful, beautiful hotel when he, uh, when he opened that thing up. Uh, with, the, with the volcano out front, I mean, people from all over were going to see that. Water shooting up. You know, it was, uh, it was just crazy beautiful how he did that. I mean, you could stand out. I remember standing out on the uh, the curb out there, and when them flames went up from the volcano, it actually sort of set you back on the hills because uh, you know it, the heat coming from that thing uh, it was was uh, was really something. It was terrific. It I, was something to see. I loved it. I remember taking a. a I, uh, excuse me. Do we have a caller here? Is there a caller? Maybe. Uh, uh, yes, caller. I'm doing a show. Did you have a question? Uh, uh, you know what? Uh, let me call you back. I'm I'm on my podcast right now. I'll call you back. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. That's that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, you do have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, not my left knee. Thank you. <laughs> but 
I remember taking a bag of marshmallows, and I, I wanted to scale the volcano and uh, <laughs> toast me some marshmallows, but I, I didn't get the, as far as I wanted to go. But the other thing, too, is that was interesting besides that. Tell them what was uh, at the front desk when they uh, arrived, the guests. Well, that was, that was something even different. They had a fish tank behind check-in that took up the whole wall. It was big. It was big. And we had floor to ceiling. And they had all live fish in there, and everybody would just stand back there. That's why the crowds were so big oh. at the front desk, just sitting there looking at all this exotic fish he had in there. And I know that a lot of people had their poles, fishing poles, wanting to get in there, but no, that wasn't going to happen. Well, I know I went up to the fish tank, and I was looking for the strings to the fish, but they were real. They were real. They were real fish. And, uh, you know, that's just not a, a tale. That's not, that's not something you see every day out there. No. And then uh, when you walk, you go through the atrium, what they call the atrium. Oh. had a waterfall with the steam going in there. Oh. It, was, uh, it was very, very, very elegant, very, uh, very beautiful setting, about and, the whole thing. And uh, not, uh, with the uh, advent of the mega resort, of course, he had the right entertainment. He had the world-famous Siegfried and Roy, which elevated them to a whole new level. They had been in town. They had been working at the Stardust. They worked at the Frontier, because I seen them at the Frontier. But he built them such a showroom at such a cost just to have those two and their menagerie of cats and their illusions. It, people were so enamored with Siegfried and Roy. I mean, you couldn't believe it. People would come out crying and so excited and wearing T-shirts that said Siegfried and then Roy. And uh, I mean, that, that took it to a whole nother level. Well, he had that one whole wing down there that was all, all glass. And you could look in and see the white tigers in there. And I mean, people were just, just standing there, just staring at these white kids. I mean, when uh, whenever you see a 600-pound tiger up close, it really, uh, it's sort of, it's an eye opener for most people. Pure white, they're beautiful, beautiful. They were great. <laughs> they sure were great. So it was, uh, it was really, really something. Then he did that uh, dolphin habitat. The secret garden. In the back secret garden. Sure, you could go back there, and uh, at the time, you could uh, you could pay money and sit there and get in the water with them, feed them or pet them or whatever you wanted to do. Uh, I think they stopped that a little later on, but what a, what a place. I mean, this place just opened this whole town wide open. He changed the face of Las Vegas. Yes, he did. Because like Pat and Penny would said, Vegas was on a slight decline. Eh, it was getting tired. It needed something refreshing, and Steve went, Steve, you out there, baby? I worked for you at the Golden Nugget, 73 to 77, when you were Zachariah as well. Them people don't know about that, but I do, and a few others that are still around. But anyway, Steve, you're definitely the, the, the godfather of Las Vegas still. Absolutely. My hat's off to you for what you, uh, what you did for this town, that's for sure. I mean, he, he definitely changed the whole face of this he, town. He was always a visionary, uh, Patton. When he uh, bought the Golden Nugget, we would have these uh, meetings in the lounge and he would talk about the future of the golden nugget how he was going to expand how he was going to bring uh entertainment kenny rogers like i told you i taught kenny rogers uh how to how to play craps he'd park his little mercedes on fremont street and he'd buy in for a hundred or two he didn't want to get to uh he wanted to get that first paycheck before he started betting a little more but uh you know it was great willie nelson no, you had all of Johnny all the Paycheck, greats, all of Barbara right. Mandrell. Yes. I mean, these were some heavy hitters in country uh, music, and he gave them another venue. And, of course, when he opened the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City, that just took him to a whole different level. I mean, he was making so much money that he bought the executives brand new cars. Yeah, he all did. All brand new cars and whatever else he could do for him because he w had gotten so successful in Atlantic City with the Golden Nugget. It was and so you could see when I'd listen to him in the lounge about his vision for the future, you knew this, this man was ahead of his time, ahead of his time. He was definitely ahead of his time. There's no doubt about that. And it was, and just the proof of the pudding is when he bought the castaways in 1987 and he opened up the Mirage. He wanted to open December of 89, but he ended up opening November 22nd of 1989 and from there on history was made history was made 
never looked back. It, he, no. uh, he changed the town to a $12 million a, a year town. Everybody had to step up to the plate. Oh, they had to. They had to. And when they saw how fi what a financial boom it was for him, as well as the town, they had to get on the gravy train. They had to get on the bandwagon or get left behind. It's what's funny. They had a little apartment building. Uh, it'd be the north uh, west corner, uh, right there where the Mirage was being built. He wanted to buy that little uh, area, those apartments. And I think there was uh, 36 or 40 apartments back there at the time, and uh, the gentleman didn't want to uh, didn't want to sell Villa uh, de Flores. Was yeah, I wish that. I had been related. I'd have forced him to sell. <laughs> Six million, he offered him. Six million, and that was that was a big chunk of my loot. A lot of money. Especially back then. Yes, but he, he decided not to sell to Steve, so Steve just sort of blocked him in on all three sides. Yeah. Built wall right around the yeah. whole uh, complex, so there you have it. And uh, that's that's how that all ended up, you know. <laughs> so I think, I, he mean, uh, I think he might have talked Siegfried and Royd into maybe letting one of them tigers loose over there, <laughs> scare the residents to leave the premises. It was almost like I mean. a, a David Goliath uh you know, it was. It was. It, it was amazing why he wouldn't. He should. Six million. I, w <laughs> I would have taken the money and, uh, and gone run. to Costa Rica and run and open up a home for wayward girls. And anyhow, they're uh, they're taking that all down now, getting ready to disassemble the whole front end of that uh, of the, the Mirage. And uh, and you can see what I'm doing. They're yeah. going to put a big guitar up big there. Big guitar. They're going to build uh, right where the uh, volcano is. Going to be a hotel. Don't know how tall yet. It's supposed to be up there pretty good. I, I can't, me, I can't imagine seeing a guitar there, but I'm sure it's going to be uh, gorgeous. You know, uh, I would say that it would have to be. You know, I think the Seminoles are going to be running all that. And how. Yeah, and how. <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, it's definitely changing. This town's changing. I, I think the also, if I'm not mistaken, the secret garden and the habitat uh, will also be gone. Uh, uh, they want to rebrand it, which uh, they're entitled to. They spent one billion in change for the uh, resort, and I'm sure it. You know, it's just that it's uh, the volcano and the habitat and its history has been so iconic for Las Vegas that, you know, it, it's it's sad to see it go. But you understand the nature of the business is that uh, Vegas is ever changing, ever changing. I mean, it's. Uh, who would have thought 20 years ago that we would have a, a hockey team, that we would have uh, the, the formerly the Oakland Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders, and now the Oakland A's are, are scouting four different sites. It was rumored that they were going to build a, a ballpark where the Tropicana was, which you would have had a ballpark on the Strip, which to me would have been fantastic. No, it would have been great. Oh, I mean, my God. right there by the airport, in and out. Nobody, you know. in, nobody in the world would have uh, something like that. So if you're listening, Oakland A's, consider it. A ballpark where the Tropicana is, you'll, you'll make more money than you have. Let's play ball. Let's play ball. That's one thing about this change. There's always change. And so far, it's always been, been just some great, the, the changes they've been making. So just like Steve Wynn changed everything in 89 with the Mirage, this town's still going to keep changing. It's going to get better and better and better. That's one thing at, uh, about this town. The weather, everything we have out here, you, you can't beat it. We don't have no bugs. We don't have no snakes. We don't have all that uh, they have back east. No horny toads either. And <laughs> We have perfect weather. Almost perfect. It's getting hot. Yeah, it's hot during summer. It's like it's cold back east. You know, you stay inside when it's hot, hot, hot. If you like it, get out in it. If you don't, stay inside. So I'm it's constantly changing this. Ever country. changing. I mean, it's changed ever since I was born in 52 at Las Vegas Hospital, and you two were born here. Hey, it has changed remarkably. And like Pat and Pending said, it is changing for the better. Of course, we're sad to see the Mirage go in its present state, but they're going to make it, they're going to rebrand it, and it's going to be even bigger and better. And I'm sure the guitar is going to have features that we aren't even aware yet that it's going to look fantastic. We, we wish the Seminoles uh, nothing but the best and good luck, and we can't wait to see what you're going to do. And I'm sure Absolutely. everybody in Las Vegas and around the world uh, will want to see also. No, uh, they, that's no doubt about that. that uh, just the, uh, 
just to, to think of, of all the changes that we've been through oh. to see all that is, uh, is pretty cool. It's pretty neat to be a part of all that. Absolutely. You know? And I want to welcome the, the new owners of the Venetian and Palazzo. Oh, yeah. I want to welcome Apollo, Apollo and VC. Good luck. You have a beautiful, beautiful hotel in both of those with the canal shops and uh, gondolas and everything else. And the employees are some of the best in the world. And we know you're going to do phenomenal. So we congratulate you and uh, good luck. And I'm sure you're going to be very successful. Sure. They have uh, the Sands Expo. They have all that right there. They, oh. they got so much. Property. Let's not forget uh, probably the ninth wonder of the world in the sphere that's being built back there. It's going to be like any like nothing ever seen or built in the world. That's true. It's going to be incredible. And they'll be able to uh, gleam a lot of business from that because I'm sure they're going to have some fantastic shows there. Oh, fantastic. I can imagine. I can imagine what they're going to have as far as uh, music venues. And uh, it's, it's, they're hooked up with New York. It's just, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. Exciting. How they're doing it. I mean, you got yeah. a golf course right across. It's going to be right across the street. You got the wind. You got the Venetian. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you're right in the middle of uh, of heaven, all down there. So well, let's, let's not forget the north side of the strip where they're gonna, the Fountain Blue is gonna. Fountain Blue is getting ready it, to. It's to go, and within 18 months, it should be going, and uh, that side of the strip will uh, definitely get a nice facelift, and uh, business should be great for them too. See, isn't that funny how when Steve bought that the Mirage, at the time everything was up. Uh, on the uh, the uh, south side of, of yeah. Las Vegas yes. on the Strip. Of course. Steve built that. Now he started moving all of that big building all coming on down. So they're moving right on down toward downtown. Yes, they are. And uh, they're moving fast. Yes, they are. And, you know, property is just going to keep going up down there. I mean, that's all prime real estate. Yes. In there. So it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of changes here uh, within the next, uh, you know, four, five, six years anyhow. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what all happens there. Uh, Can't wait. Uh, is there anyone you want to acknowledge today? Uh, is there anybody that you'd like to... I would like uh, to uh, clear choice. I'd like to uh, Carrie Thacker. She's a little gal over there that works at Clear Choice, a little doctor. I'm fantastic. I just uh, think she's the greatest thing that's ever come along. Any relation to Lester? Uh, absolutely. I believe so. Uh, yes. Uh, I know a few of them uh, Thackers out there. I, I do, I do. One worked at the Hilton, and I went to school. I know Lester since he was a youngin, like myself, uh, in our uh, formative years in uh, junior high. And uh, so, Carrie, say hello to Lester. Dan Flor Danny Craps says Danny hello. Danny Craps, that's it. And, uh, you know, our uh, aggress uh, John Stiles. I mean, uh, you know, you got What can you, you say, say about, about John, John Stiles? Stiles. Uh, not uh, all of it on the uh, on the uh, podcast. You know, I mean, uh, he needs to eat more yeah. cans of spinach, but oh. yes. He's at www.dbtv.com. Uh, I also want to give an acknowledgement to Joe at the Mediterranean Grill on Durango. Fabulous Greek food. Excellent. The people there, first rate. Joe and his mother, beautiful, beautiful. She's there all the time to greet you with a smile. Go see Joe at the Mediterranean Grill. The food is fantastic. And matter of fact, I'll be there Sunday at five o'clock uh, doing some, uh, you know, oompa, as they say. Oompa. Uh, maybe I'll break a few dishes and glasses. <laughs> Don't charge me, oompa? Joe. Uh, no, I can't. Uh, yeah. Pat and I probably have to go to the chiropractor and be in traction for six months <laughs> trying to lift my leg up that high and other parts of the body, uh, which I'll remain nameless. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of fun talking about all this today. I've, uh, I've enjoyed every bit of this. It's, it's good to be able to sit there and talk a little bit about town where we grew up in. You know, that's what I'm. Uh, that's what I enjoy about the whole thing. Absolutely. And I'm just hoping all the viewers out there would can relate to wherever they grew up. They'd be able to do something like this. You know, this has been uh, it's been a lot of fun. And of course, like I said, John Styles, he's made it all happen for us. Oh. So, uh, you know, I mean, if you want to send in comments to us, it's uh, the Vegas Dice Kings 22 at gmail.com. Uh, you can uh, you can email us 
we'd love to hear stories or some stuff that you would like to uh, share with us, ask questions. It'd be great. We have a platform for not only the history of Las Vegas and what happened prior, but listen, if you've got a story, come on, share it with us. We want, we want to have a wide range of audience so they can enjoy listening to what we have to say and others out there you can have a platform too and say what you want to say. Absolutely. Everyone's welcome. Everyone is welcome. Absolutely. Yes. So I love it. I love it. Me too. And keep rolling them bones. Yes. Don't forget, roll them bones. Get lucky. Listen, 7 Eleven, <laughs> come out, roll. Here we go. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And make your points. Make your points. Just I like agree. in life, make your points. Keep on rolling. Keep on rolling. I agree. All right. Thank you for watching, everyone. Thank so long, you everyone. So, so long. long. Patent pending. Danny, Danny Crafts. We love all of you. Keep listening and send them cards and letters. Mm -hmm. Support us because, uh, you know, we don't want to turn into a cooking show. I'm a <laughs> lousy cook. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>